Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Miller. I am chairman of the Elder Board, and I have the privilege of speaking to you while uh, Pastor James is on vacation with his family. For those of you who are disappointed that Pastor James isn't here, I will try to do this with a Canadian accent, eh? <laughs> See if that helps. Uh, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Jean. See what I just did there? French-Canadian. Took it up a level, eh? <laughs> Let's get started. Many of you have heard of Horatio Spafford. Even if you don't know his name, you may be familiar with his story. During the 1800s, he was a successful businessman living in Chicago with his wife and five children. He was a devout follower of Christ, but his life was not without his share of pain and loss. In 1871, his young son died of pneumonia, and later that year, his fortune was lost because of the Great Chicago Fire. He had invested heavily in real estate along the shores of Lake Michigan, and it was all destroyed overnight. Two years later, in 1873, he decided to sail to Europe with his wife, Anna, and his four daughters to join his friend, famous evangelist D.L. Moody, as he traveled across Great Britain preaching the word of God. Due to a last-minute business matter, uh, he was Horatio sent his wife and daughters on ahead with plans to catch another ship a few days later. And so it was he was not with his family when it collided with another ship at sea and sank within 12 minutes. His wife was found clinging to a piece of floating wreckage, but all four of his daughters died. When his wife reached Wales a few days later, she cabled him, saved alone, what shall I do? Another of the ship's survivors later recalled that Anna told him, God has given me four daughters, now he has taken them from me. Someday I will understand why. Horatio sailed to join his grieving wife on the next available ship. When that ship was about four days out, the captain told them they were over the spot in the ocean where his children had perished. And it was there on the deck of that ship that Horatio Spafford wrote the words that would later be set to music and become one of the world's most beloved hymns. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I'd like to stop here for a moment and read today's scripture passage, John 14, 27 through 31. I'm going to read through the entire passage and then we will go back and look at some of the verses a little closer. I encourage you to follow along in your Bibles, your smartphone if you have it. It will also be up on the screen for you as well. So John 14, 27 through 31, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you ask, add your blessing to the reading of your word, that you will open our, our, our hearts and ears to hear what it is you want us to learn. We ask this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Horatio Spafford lost his daughters on November 22nd, 1873. That date jumped out at me when I read his story because it was 100 years and two days later, November 24th, 1973, that my own life was turned upside down. That was the day my mother passed away unexpectedly. It was the fall of my freshman year of high school and I was 14. At the time, I was a Catholic being raised in a, long, in a family that was a long line of Catholics. My dad had been an altar boy. His cousins were nuns. His brother was a monsignor in the Catholic Church. Now, I realized that my experience with the Catholic religion may not have been the same experience that other Catholics had. But for me, my Catholicism was a matter of fact, not of faith. It had taught me to follow rules, observe rituals, carry around guilt, and fear God. It was all I had ever known, and because of the way I had been raised, I wholeheartedly believed it was the only true religion. Anyone who wasn't a Catholic 
was condemned for all eternity. And yet, it hadn't taught me how to have a relationship with God. There was no intimacy, no joy, no connecting with him in a personal way. So there I was at 14, facing one of the greatest losses of my life, and it never occurred to me to turn to God for comfort. The thought that I could go to God with my pain, it never even crossed my mind. To me, prayer meant repeating the Hail Mary and the Our Father repeatedly, and how was that going to help? I was feeling lost and adrift. During the spring of that same year, my older sister was invited to a Bible-believing church by one of her best friends from school, a girl named Lori. It was at that church that my sister encountered God in a personal, life-changing way, and so she started attending the church regularly. Eventually, she invited her to join her at one of the church. She invited me to join her at one of the church services. So I agreed to try it out, and as I think about it now, it was a remarkable thing for me to do. I was one of those kids with little to no self-confidence. My days at school were spent staying off the radar, keeping my head down, trying not to draw attention to myself. I didn't expect to fit in with the cool kids, and that was okay. I just wanted to be left alone and not be teased. And yet, because I trusted my sister, I find myself visiting a 100-member youth group at a church I had never been to before. But the thing was, instead of feeling intimidated by the whole experience, I felt welcomed and accepted. This was due in a large part to my sister's friend, Lori, and Lori's boyfriend, Randy. Randy and Lori. Now, there was a couple. Lori was one of the prettiest girls I'd ever met, and Randy was beyond cool in my eyes. He was a senior. I was a freshman. He was good-looking, drove a 66 Mustang, played the guitar, sang, surfed, and even wore a puka shell necklace. <laughs> Lori was the girl every guy wanted to date, and Randy was the guy all the other guys wanted to be like. Randy had it all, so it would have been very easy for him to be kind of a jerk, but he wasn't. He and Lori were the nicest people you would ever want to meet. They were warm, loving, and welcoming to everyone around them. From the moment Randy met me during my first visit to that church, he treated me like I was a friend. Not just a friend, but a good friend. The welcome he and Lori showed me was a big part of the reason I kept going back to that church. Later that summer, I walked down to the front of the church during the evening service and gave my life to Christ. It was at that moment I discovered a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, and my life was forever changed. But the fact that I'm walking with God today can be traced back to the acceptance I felt from Randy and Lori. I have some wonderful memories from those years. Randy's parents hosted a Bible study in their home every Monday night that was open to all the high school kids. Randy would play the guitar and lead us in worship. Remember the time he wanted to try out what was a new song at the time, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. So when he asked us, hey, do you guys know I've decided to follow Jesus? He had a great sense of humor and laughed when we told him, wow, that's great, Randy. We've been praying for you. <laughs> Think about it. One of the fondest memories I have of him was from a time a group of us were packed in their car and driving home from a concert. Randy was in the middle seat of my dad's station wagon with Lori cuddled up against him. He played the guitar and sang to her, Annie's Song by John Denver. You fill up my senses like a night in the forest, like the mountains in springtime, like a walk in the rain, like a storm in the desert, like a sleepy blue ocean. You fill up my senses, come fill me again. Come, let me love you, let me give my life to you, let me drown in your laughter, let me die in your arms. I remember thinking, man, I wish I could find a love like that someday. Fortunately, God granted me that prayer and blessed me with an amazing woman to be my wife. But that's a story for another time. A year after Randy graduated high school, he was diagnosed with leukemia. The shock of it hit everyone who knew him hard, and there was an army of people praying for him as he went through treatment at the City of Hope. Eventually, with a pill form of chemotherapy and doctor's visits, he was able to lead a relatively normal life. So he and Lori decided to get married, even though his future was uncertain. They were married when he was a month shy of his 20th birthday, and Lori was 18. I remember Lori talking about how much she loved being married to Randy, how much fun he was to be around. She tells the story of how he would wait for her to take a bite of her cereal and then try to make her laugh, hoping she would spit out the cereal while laughing. 
After two years of married life, the leukemia came back with a vengeance, and Randy was running out of options. But they were sure that God would heal him, in the, that God would heal him. In the last week of his life, one of his sisters was in a terrible car accident coming down from the mountains, and Randy, along with his in-laws, had to go bring her home, even though he was very ill at the time. During the final hours of his time on earth, Randy was in a coma. Lori was at his bedside, and the thought occurred to her that he might pass away without ever giving her another hug. It wasn't intended as a prayer. It was just a thought. But God heard the desire of her heart, and at that moment, Randy turned over and reached out his arm for Lori. His eyes were still closed, so his mother guided his arm, and he put it around Lori and gave her that final hug. It was his last gift to his wife, and he passed away within an hour of that moment. He was 22 years old, and they'd been married only two and a half years. The church was standing room only for his memorial service, and right before it started, Randy's sister, with her jaw wired shut because of the accident, walked down the aisle of the church, supporting herself on her father's arm. It was all too much to bear. The grief and pain in the room were overwhelming. Then, there came a point in the service when all the people present began to sing. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And as we sang, the Spirit of God swept across the room and I was filled with a sense of peace and well-being. To this day, it has stood out as one of the defining moments in my walk with God. There was absolutely no logical reason I should feel such a sense of peace, but there I was experiencing firsthand what was written in Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This leads me to the first point in the outline. There's a copy of the outline in the bulletin for those of you who wish to follow along. There may or may not be a test later. The peace that the world offers is because of our circumstances, but the peace God offers is despite our circumstances. The peace the world offers is because of our circumstances, but the peace that God offers is despite our circumstances. I'm not saying the world can't offer you moments that fill you with peace and contentment. It absolutely can. But they're typically dependent on the circumstances around us. You can feel peace when you're spending time with people you care about or in a place that you love. You can feel at peace when everything goes right during your day, when you have a financial windfall, when you get a clean bill of health, or simply because you're camped out on the couch watching a favorite movie with your dog curled up in your lap. But by comparison, the peace that God offers is a supernatural peace that sustains us through the most difficult moments in life. Christian author and speaker A.T. Pearson wrote, the peace of God is that eternal calm which lies far too deep in the praying, trusting soul to be reached by any external disturbances. That's worth repeating. The peace of God is that eternal calm which lies far too deep in the praying, trusting soul to be reached by any external disturbances. Dr. Michelle Bengston, author of the book, Hope Prevails, put it this way. God's peace is not the calm after the storm. It is the steadfastness during it. I love that. I'm not saying that as a Christ follower, you will never have pain, sorrow, or disappointment. You will have those things and more. It is part of being alive on this earth. But what I am saying is in the middle of our deepest pain and suffering, God can meet us and offer us a peace that passes understanding, a sense of comfort that defies our circumstances. Corey Ten Boom, who survived the Nazi concentration camps but lost her family members to them, wrote, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. My encouragement to you is this. When you are hurting, when you are afraid, when you feel that whatever you're going through is too much to bear, lean into God. Let him carry you let him sustain you. 
Let him be your peace. Let's move on by looking back at verse 30 of the scripture passage. Jesus is again speaking and he says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. The ruler of this world is Satan and Jesus is saying that because he himself is without sin, Satan has no hold on him. The New King James translates, he has no claim on me as he has nothing in me. John MacArthur puts it this way, the Hebrew idiom, nothing in me, means that Satan had nothing on Jesus, could make no claim on him, nor charge him with any sin. Therefore, Satan could not hold him in death. And the amazing thing about God's love and God's grace is this. When we've accepted Christ as our Savior and are covered by his blood, we can make the exact same statement about ourselves. Satan has no claim on me, and he cannot charge me with any sin. Colossians 1, verses 21 and 22 tells us, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Unfortunately, while we are covered by Christ's sacrificial work on the cross and God sees us as blameless, we sometimes give Satan an invitation to hold us accountable. We hold on to guilt, shame, and regret, and we allow Satan to play on our emotions. This brings us to the second point of the outline. Satan has no claim on us unless we give it to him. Satan has no claim on us unless we give it to him. Often, even though God has forgiven us for our actions, we are unable to forgive ourselves. Daniel Siemens, author of the book, Healing for Damaged Emotions, put it this way. There is no forgiveness from God unless you freely forgive your brother from your heart. And I wonder if we've been too narrow in thinking that brother only applies to someone else. What if you are the brother or sister who needs to be forgiven and you need to forgive yourself? Satan loves to throw the past up in our faces and use it against us. He loves to convince us that we are not worthy of forgiveness, that God doesn't really love us because of the things we have done. But Satan is using a half-truth when he does this. He is right that we are not worthy of God's forgiveness, but that is the whole point of God's grace. His grace is his unmerited favor given to us. Where Satan has it completely wrong is in telling us that God doesn't love us because of the things we have done. The truth is, God loves us because of who we are and despite what we have done. Author Philip Yancey states it like this, there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There is nothing we can do to make God love us less. Let that sink in. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There is nothing we can do to make God love us less. I recently came across a story from a missionary to China named Rosalind Goforth. Rosalind Goforth, what a great name for a missionary. Go forth, as in go forth and spread the word. Wouldn't it be cool to have your names that reflected your jobs? Instead of spending 31 years teaching fourth grade as Mr. Miller, I would be Mr. Weasel Wrangler. Think about it. In fact, Robert, wave your hand, wave to the nice people. Robert is one of my former weasels. I had him in fourth grade. He just graduated Glendora High. He's going off to Grand Canyon University. Love to have you here, Robert. So Rosalind Goforth was a well-known missionary to China, who, along with her husband, Jonathan, enjoyed an illustrious career in ministry. But for many years, even having labored for the Lord in China, Rosalind often felt oppressed by a burden of sin. She felt guilty and dirty, nursing an inward sense of spiritual failure. Finally, one evening when all was quiet, she settled at her desk with her Bible in concordance, determined to find out God's attitude towards the failures, the faults, the sins of his children. She put these words at the top of the page, what God does with our sins. Then as she searched through the scriptures, she compiled this list of 17 truths. And here is what God does with our sins. 
He lays them on his son, Jesus Christ, Isaiah 53, 6. Christ takes them away, John 1, They are removed an immeasurable distance as far as the east is from the west, Psalm 123, 12. When sought for, they are not found, Jeremiah 50, 20. The Lord forgives them, Ephesians 1, 7. He cleanses them all away by the blood of his son, 1 John 1, 7. He cleanses them as white as snow or wool, Isaiah 118, Psalm 51, 7. He abundantly pardons them, Isaiah 55, 7. He tramples them underfoot, Micah 7, 19. He remembers them no more, Hebrews 10, 17. He casts them behind his back, Isaiah 38, 17. He casts them into the depths of the sea, Micah 7, 19. He will not impute us with sins, Romans 4, 8. He covers them, Romans 4, 7. He blots them out, Isaiah 43, 25. He blots them out as a thick cloud, Isaiah 44, 22. He blots out even the proof against us, nailing it to his son's cross, Colossians 2, 14. That list is in your bulletin. I encourage you to take through this week, read through it, look up those scriptures, pray over them, and let them sink into your heart. It is clear that the redemptive work of Christ means that God is no longer holding our sins against us. Don't let Satan convince you otherwise. I attended a conference for, for church leaders in Orange County last month, and the speaker illustrated this point beautifully. He told us that as we were listening to the speakers, others had gone out into the parking lot and covered the windshields of all our cars with newspaper. We were not allowed to remove the newspaper, we were expected to drive the whole way home on busy Southern California freeways by looking only in the rearview mirrors. Obviously, it couldn't be done. So what was his point? That it was impossible to move forward while only looking back. So as God is calling you to grow in relationship to him, to move forward in your walk with him, don't let Satan sidetrack you by reminding you of past failures. When you've accepted the lordship of Jesus in your life, your sins have been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Just tell Satan, I have no idea what you are talking about. I have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Finally, let's look back at verse 31 of our passage. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. When Jesus spoke these words, he was referring to what lay ahead of him, the Garden of Gethsemane and death on the cross. He knew that immeasurable pain and suffering were waiting for him, but he was unwilling to endure it as a witness to others of his love for the Father. This brings us to the third point of the outline. Our obedience to God shows others that we love him. Our obedience to God shows others that we love him. We are to live our lives in such a way that it is obvious to those around us that we love God. And the simplest way we show our love for God is by following his commandments. But what does that mean? What does that look like in our daily lives? There are too many commandments in the Bible for us to consider here today, so let's just focus on two of them. Jesus is speaking in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, and he says, And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. As the people around you who know that you are a Christ follower watch you, and trust me, they are watching you, is your love for God obvious? Do they see that following God and showing his love to others is your top priority? If you profess your love for God, do your actions back it up? I'm asking these questions of myself as well as of you. And if being honest, I have to say that my answer would be sometimes, but not nearly enough. And then I have to ask myself, why not? What is holding me back from giving God the best I have to offer when it comes to my time, my talent, and my finances? I'm reminded of a quote that many of you have probably heard before. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you. John Trent, co-author of The Hidden Value of a Man, writes, when I led a young life group, I did my best to round up kids who really needed to hear the gospel when we went to summer camp. 
Mark was one of those kids. Bob Mitchell, the main speaker that week, called most of the shots, including when meals would be served. So Mitch was always talking with the cook. The cook loved her work, but it was exhausting. She always looked tired. Whenever she talked to Mitch, she got up and gave her his chair and a moment's rest while they discussed meal plans. Nobody noticed Mitch doing this except Mark. Mark hadn't come to hear about Jesus, but when he saw Jesus' love lived out in the simple act of kindness by the camp speaker, he began to listen to Mitchell's talks. Later that week, Mark asked Jesus to be his savior. And it wasn't because of the messages, Mark said, but because of the love he saw in Mitch. If that's what it means to be a Christian, Mark said, I want to be one. So, if others don't see the, life, the love of Christ modeled in your life, where will they see it? Pray and ask God to show you ways that you can bring the light of Christ to others on a daily basis. Be looking for opportunities, both big and small, where you can show kindness to others. Model integrity, generosity, and compassion to those around you. It's not always easy, especially when things are happening in your life that make you want to react in anger or frustration. But ask God to give you the self-control and patience you need to be his witness. Let me end this message with three thoughts to take away today. First, God's peace is not the calm after the storm. It is the steadfastness during it. When you're going through trials, hang on to him. Second, don't give the devil a foothold in your life. He has no claim on you. Finally, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. That one is worth repeating. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Now, I realize I've been talking primarily to those of you who are Christ followers this morning, but everything I have talked about today is freely available to every single person in this room. God is there for all who call on him, and his promises are there for all who have chosen to follow his son, Jesus Christ. For those of you who are not Christ followers, I invite you to become one. It really is as easy as ABC. A, admit that you are a sinner and need the saving power of Christ in your life. B, believe that Christ died for your sins. C, Choose to live your life for God and allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Trust me, it is the most important decision you will ever make, and a decision to follow Christ is one you will never regret. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your spirit that gives us peace and comfort in the most difficult times in lives. Teach us to hold on to you for our strength. Thank you for the fact that we can claim Satan has no claim on us that you do not hold us accountable for our sins because of the work of your son on the cross. And finally, help us to live our lives in such a way that people see us and they want to know what is different about us and they want to know about our God. I ask these things in your name.